Thank you, thank you. No, thank you very much, McKenna. I was uh, doing too many things at the same time and that would have been really bad. But uh, I got it recording now. So for better or worse, it's recording. Phew, saved me. Okay. Well, Women are looking for guys that have good job prospects. One way of getting a good job prospect is getting a good education. And women are looking for guys that are willing to seek job prospects, good education. Uh, and typically, because we're all college type people, we think in terms of college type stuff. But um, I'm a high school vocational rat. I was in that area because I was doing the drafting stuff. Uh, my friends were taking college prep classes. So the only reason I took college prep classes was to hang out with my friends. I got lucky. I never was going to go to college. Um, but to me, uh, you know, doing vocational training is good for job prospects. And if you look at certain uh, skills like plumbers, welders, stuff like that. They're in high demand now and it's a skilled trade. So I consider that a good educational thing now. It's just not necessarily a bachelor's degree or something like that, which seems kind of weird for a professor to say, but there's lots of different skills and there's lots of different intelligences. And, excuse me, I thought I talked for an hour in the history class and I looked at the clock and it was 10 to 12. Uh, so I'm a little out of voice. So education, job prospects. Um, women are more likely to uh, dump guys, discontinue relationships with guys that become unemployed, lose career motivation, show laziness, stuff like that. Uh, here's Don Draper from the old Mad Men series. Women also prefer guys with high social status. Why? Because status is generally uh, co-varies with resources. High status jobs usually mean more money, except I would say in higher education just to make an editorial comment. Uh, so women are looking for guys that are high status and social status is only slightly less important to women in their long-term mates than good financial stuff. Uh, women like guys that are hardworking, that are ambitious, uh, that enjoy their work, that show career orientation. Uh, guys that are ambitious uh, have to tell us a tale about my mentor, the second author of your textbook, David Buss. Um, while I was a graduate student with Buss, he got divorced from his first wife. And then he did something that, in fact, I just had a some email exchanges with David that he didn't realize that this had upset me so much. Of course, he didn't care. Uh, but uh, one of my best research assistants I have ever, ever, ever had was while I was in graduate school. And the woman was a reentry student. Uh, she had been a, a personal secretary to the CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And uh, my lab was, okay, some of these were getting feedback from my microphone here. I'm sorry, moved the thing. Uh, that distracted me, I'm sorry. So anyway, Cindy was just amazingly good at organization. My lab has never been so organized as when Cindy was running it. We were doing some major projects and we had lots and lots of data to organize. Uh, the data set that Cindy helped me with had well over a million points of data. And uh, she was a reentry student, uh, and so she and David hit it off, and they started dating. And she quit being my research assistant because of the conflict of interest. 
and uh, I still resent him for taking away my best research assistant, even though it's been over 30 years. But uh, Cindy still remained a personal friend and uh, was one of part of our group of people who were students working in the lab. So uh, we were all curious. We were eating lunch one day and we asked uh, Cindy, well, what does the famous evolutionary psychologist who studies dating and mating uh, do when he takes you out on a date? And uh, turns out she goes, well, most of our dates are at his condo. Yeah, the divorce guy's condo. And I sit on his patio, Cindy sitting on the patio, and read, and he works. And I thought, not much of a Lance romance there, but he loves his work, spends lots of time doing it, and she was feeding into that part of his personality. And they eventually got married and were married for many, many years, and unfortunately she passed away about 10 years ago. Uh, so hard work. Dependability and stability. Women want guys who are dependable and stable. Emotionally unstable guys can be very costly to a woman and her children. My aunt was married to a very emotionally unstable guy who ended up being an alcoholic causing her all kinds of problems. Uh, he always had these get rich quick schemes. He could never keep a job. He was always gonna make his money on this. And he was one of the first guys to, uh, what well, I remember having to go over to their house and sit in the basement while my parents heard all kinds of sale pitches from vacuum cleaners to pots to pans to knives to all this stuff. And the next thing was always gonna make him a lot of money and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they eventually got divorced and uh, she did much better. She didn't have any children with him, but he had stepkids or she had stepkids from his marriage. And uh, her kids had a lot of uh, problems. He eventually died of his alcoholism. So stability and dependability important. Sorry, on the wrong window here, okay. Women like guys who like kids, who are willing to invest in children. My stepson, who is now uh, 40, which is hard to believe that I've got a 40 year old stepson, but my ex-wife was much older than me. Little dig there. Uh, when we had my first biological kid, and I only talk about this to keep the lines straight with you guys, I don't talk about them when I talk personally in this way at all. They're all just my kids. But uh, there's a 14 year age gap between my oldest David and my stepson James. Uh, are we worried about this quite a bit? Uh, but James, uh, did a real good job and he's a really good brother. He's kind of more of an uncle now than a brother, but he's been very good to the boys. And when uh, David was about 15 or 16, he started to, he came up with this little thing. He came, he, after dinner one night, I was still married to my ex. Uh, James goes, uh, can I take the baby for a walk so you guys have some free time? And so we thought, well, that's really cool of him. So we let him do it. And then this started to become an almost nightly thing. He used to take uh, his brother David out when he was about nine, 10 months old for a walk for about an hour every night. So after doing that for two or three days, we thought, hmm, we asked him if he wanted some company on these walks. He said, no, no, we don't want, on a, you guys need a break. Now, James borders on being a con artist sometimes, especially when he was a teenager. So he figured something was up. So I tailed him one time and uh, found out that he was pushing the stroller with his brother in it. And he had a swarm of little 13, 14 year old girls around him 
helping him walk his baby brother. So basically he was using uh, his brother as chick bait. He was showing that he cared about a child and the girls thought that was really cool. Now, not everybody that we date, we necessarily want to be with for 147 years uh, or for a super long time. Sometimes we get involved in short-term mating. So I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about short-term mating. Again, in the 157 class, this is like a day and a half of class time, but you're getting the shorthand version. Uh, animals of all species mate in different ways. Now, STM is short-term mating. That's the abbreviation for it. We have high rates of what is called non-conceptive sex as a species. Non-conceptive sex is the boring scientific way of, we just have sex for fun. And we are one of the few species of animals that has sex for pure physical enjoyment without the intent of reproducing. Uh, in species that um, engage in short-term mating or in different mating strategies, there's usually dimorphism or different sizes between the males and females. In humans, we have moderate sexual dimorphism. Men are on average about 10% taller, 20% heavier than women. Uh, this is opposed to other species. So here is a uh, big silverback uh, alpha male gorilla with a female. You can see the big size difference there. And usually where you have uh, harem type mating situations in a pack or a troop of like you have with gorillas, the alphas are really big, the males are really big, the females are smaller. Why? Because the males have to fight it out for alpha dominance. Here's an even more extreme example of that. There is uh, the guy with his mouth open, and the women in class can probably say, when doesn't the guy have his mouth open? Uh, is the male elephant seal. These are real, not Photoshop elephant seals. You can see that he's massively bigger than the female that he's next to. So we have some dimorphism. Also testicle size is another evidence of short-term mating. Uh, Large testicles have evolved as a consequence, excuse me, back itching, uh, of intense male sperm competition. Now, many of you may, know, may not have thought of your sperm as competing with each other. And actually your sperm don't, men sperm don't compete with each other. It's across men, different men, different males. Chimpanzees uh, have no, mating system. They just kind of mate with each other. There's no monogamy at all. And so a female chimpanzee, when she's in estrus ovulating and receiving, sexually receiving males, may have the sperm in her of multiple males. And in this species, uh, for example, who gets to be the daddy? Oh, the baby chimps. In litter-bearing mammals, like dogs and cats, uh, it's not uncommon uh, for the female to produce a litter that has more than one father. You might have, they're all the same mom, but you might have several fathers in the litter of puppies or kittens. So in animals that don't have long-term mating, sperm competition is a major thing. In us, it's kind of a thing because we don't exclusively mate monogamously, but we don't exclusively mate indiscriminately either. 
And when you look at testicle size, it has to do with the issue of females routinely having sex with more than one male at a time. So you get this sperm competition. Uh, you get several outgrowths of this. One is testicle size. I think we may have talked about this with the dominance lecture. The more monogamous the species, the smaller uh, the testicle size is adjusted in body weight. So gorillas adjusted for body weight have small testicles. Humans are kind of in the middle. Uh, chimpanzees adjusted for body weight have extremely large testicles. Savez and his colleagues um, also found a difference in sperm quality based on the mating uh, style of different species. Here's a summary chart here. Uh, the average number of defective sperm per ejaculate, orangutans who may uh, have no monogamy at all, bonobos, the sexiest of all apes, Bonobos make us look extremely um, prudish in our sexual practices as a species. Uh, look at one and a half, two percent defective sperm for ejaculate. Uh, chimps, 4.5. Humans, the average human male ejaculate, 27% uh, defective sperm. Uh, gorillas, 29% uh defective sperm now you only need one sperm to preg impregnate a female but if you're not competing with other males uh you don't need all perfect sperm so there's little evidence with that with short-term mating uh what do guys want in a short-term mate fertility not reproductive value uh this is where guys are most dis indiscriminate so male short-term strategists avoid women who are prudish conservative have low sex drives or lack of sexual experience they're looking for women that they can have a very quick sexual relationship with now just because a woman dresses in a sexy manner doesn't mean she wants sex with any particular guy we always have to put that caveat out there but short-term strategists, males look for women that are showing signs of sexuality, like sexual experience, promiscuity, dressing provocatively, stuff like that. That's pretty easy to figure out that males want short-term mates far more than females do. But women get involved in short-term mating as well. It takes two to tango. Uh, so why would women have an interest in pursuing uh, relationships with other guys than the person they're with. And a lot of short-term mating is having affairs. Affairs count as short-term mating. Uh, you find that women uh, pay more attention to masculine features, uh, testosterone features, health features in men when they're ovulating. In fact, women uh, will time their extramarital affairs to their ovulatory cycles, as I just said. Uh, if you look at the cartoon here, I usually don't steal uh, copyrighted cartoons, but I do it for educational purposes, so I get away with it. Uh, and you see here, you see these two women and one saying, I'm a one-man woman, one on Monday, one on Tuesday, one on dot, dot, dot. So women are looking for guys with testosterone cues, uh, masculine features, when they are looking to have an affair. Uh, why would women uh, want to have an affair? What is going on? Uh, several reasons. One hypothesis is resources. You might get several males to help support your kids if someone can't figure out who the dad is. Uh, so one hypothesis is the paternity confusion hypothesis. Uh, you might have a short-term affair to have a guy protect you if need be. Or you might do it to get a quick boost in social status. 
Now, um, some of these don't work quite well anymore since DNA testing, uh, the fraternity confusion ones kind of out the door, kind of put the Jerry Springer show and that kind of stuff out of business a bit. Uh, but let me ask you if you could name any other, uh, unless you know them personally, White House intern except for Monica Lewinsky, uh, who had a dalliance with President Clinton, and that's where she got her fame from. One of the most intriguing um, hypotheses as to why women may engage in short-term mating uh, is called the genetics benefits hypothesis. And there are two of them, and then one ancillary one. Uh, Helen Fisher, the anthropologist who has studied things from an evolutionary point of view for a very long time, uh, has come up with something she calls the sexy son hypothesis. And uh, hypothesis kind of works like this. A woman has a good long-term stable mate uh, but has an affair with this really, really sexy guy. And then has a child by him. If that child is a guy, a male, he may go out and have lots of affairs with lots of women. And as her sexy son, uh, even though he would only be spreading around one quarter of his genes to each of these offspring, if you have a sexy son and you're a woman, you could conceivably greatly increase your reproductive success. Now, I had a very weird thing happen to me a couple of months ago because I found out I may be the product of a sexy son. Um, my father calls me up just about two months ago. Uh, actually, not even that, because I had already done the short-term mating lecture in the evolutionary psych class and couldn't work this out. My dad says, I got to talk to you about something. And my dad's in his 80s, and my mom is too, and first thing, I always worry about health stuff. And he goes, guess what? I just found out that I have a half brother and uh, that nobody knew about. This is one of those things that uh, somebody was doing ancestry.com and found out uh, that they were my dad's half brother. My grandmother had been married to a guy who basically dumped her and my father uh, ages and ages ago. And uh, the guy I thought was my paternal grandfather was my paternal step-grandfather. And I didn't know that until I was in my mid twenties and married when my dad told me, I thought it was a big family secret. Uh, I asked grandma about it one time and she goes, oh, he was this bum Russian guy who took off and it's no big deal. He just was a loser. And so I took it at that. So a couple of months ago, somebody contacts my sister on Ancestry.com wanting to get in touch with my dad. And it turns out uh, my dad's real father, the guy that had left my grandmother, when he was 62, which is how old I am right now, had an affair with a woman and she got pregnant and had a baby. She was married. She didn't tell her husband or her son. And on her deathbed, she told her son who his father really was. And so this guy contacted my dad. So my dad's got a half brother he has never met. They had planned to meet this summer with this coronavirus thing, who knows. But I have a half uncle who um, is younger than me. He's only 48, uh, who I've never met. Kind of freaky. 
when you teach this stuff and you have these personal examples, it gets pretty bizarre. So sexy son, so I might be the result of a sexy son. Uh, another reason a woman might uh, get genetic benefits by having affairs and having multiple uh, fathers to her children is genetic diversity. Interesting to talk about in the COVID-19 days. If all of your kids uh, have basically 50% mom genes, 50% dad genes from the same father, from the same mother, and they can succumb to a disease, something like COVID-19 comes along, it might wipe out the entire family. If your children have different genes from different fathers, maybe uh, one of your kids would survive uh, something as horrible as we're going through right now, the coronavirus. Now, naturally, this isn't a conscious thing women do. Women don't say, I'm going to have an affair so I have different genes for my kids. But it's the result of the affair. Then another reason my women might get involved in short-term mating is mate, excuse me, mate switching. Uh, it might be a way to get out of a relationship that a woman no longer wants to be in. Uh, so they might want to swap out. Lots more reasons, lots more things for that one. But like I said, short-term versions of all of these lectures. Next topic, jealousy. Uh, one of the things that we know is that we steal each other's mates. Up to 20% of long-term relationships start when one or both partners are involved with somebody else. Doesn't matter whether the other person is dating someone, married, engaged, living with someone, across, happens at all different phases of relationships. We steal each other's mates. Over 80% of all individuals surveyed report that they or a partner uh, had been uh, the target of someone trying to poach them, uh, steal them from their current partner. So we steal, we steal each other's mates. We take them. Uh, one of the other things that we're not going to talk about too much here is mate copying. We tend to, uh, especially women do this more than men. If a woman sees a guy as being a really good uh, partner, she might want to steal him because the assumption would be she would be his good partner. So we steal each other's mates. Now we have developed psychological mechanisms to defend ourselves against mate poaching or stealing. And that's uh, going to be jealousy. But I didn't get through all of my slides here. Let me finish my mate poaching stuff. Sorry, got ahead of myself. 62% uh, of men, 40% of women surveyed have tried to steal someone else's partner. 47% of men, 32% of women have defected because of mate poaching attempts. So you have to be on guard to make sure someone is not trying to steal your mate. So we have developed as humans, as a species, sexual jealousy as a mechanism to thwart off uh, mate poaching attempts. Uh, several good quotes about sexual jealousy. The poet and writer Maya Angelou says that jealousy in romance is like salt in food. A little can enhance the savor or the taste, but too much can spoil the pleasure and under certain, certain circumstances be life-threatening, which is a very true statement. We have, the literature is full of people who have murdered other people due to sexual jealousy, either rivals or partners or things like that. In fact, uh, it, in the 1960s, it was still uh, considered uh, 
a non-murderous offense in Texas if a man found his partner having an affair with another person and killed them. Now, it didn't go the other way, a woman finding a guy having an affair, but uh, a guy finding out that his woman having an affair and killed the woman or her lover uh, was justifiable homicide. That's changed, it's no longer true. Uh, Erica Jung, the 1970s writer, says jealousy is all the fun you think they had. And my favorite jealousy quote comes from one of my favorite comedians, Rodney Dangerfield. My wife's jealous is get, jealousy is getting ridiculous. The other day she looked at my calendar and wanted to know who May was. Now, just as I recently found out that I was a uh, product of a sexy son, um, in my first marriage, I was the victim of pathological jealousy. My ex-wife was excessively jealous. Uh, and I reacted to it in a very bad way, and I'm kind of ashamed the way that I reacted to it. I should have not put up with it. Uh, but it was my ex's second marriage, and uh, supposedly her first husband had cheated on her, so she was very sensitive, I thought, to people cheating. Uh, but she accused me of sleeping with virtually every woman that I knew that wasn't her. Uh, in graduate school, it was fellow graduate students. When I started working at the university, my ex accused me of having affairs with all of my research assistants. And uh, to combat this, I did something that I uh, now I look back at and think is stupid. Eventually, it got so bad, I renamed all my female research assistants with male names when I was talking to her so that I wouldn't have to deal with her jealousy. Um, and she's still pathologically jealous. I just don't have to deal with it anymore. Uh, let me tell you one story on my ex and her jealousy. Now, her third husband, uh, is a wannabe musician. And uh, my ex likes to think of herself as very religious. No, it didn't. It, you know, I thought it would. You come up with all of these strategies. Yvonne said the changing the names help. No. Uh, a very, very long time ago, one of my, uh, I'll tell another story on jealousy and then I'll tell the story I was starting. But uh, one of my psychi presidents was a woman, which isn't uncommon because most of my psychi presidents have been women. I'm the advisor for the group. Uh, very attractive. Uh, she was working in my lab. And uh, I was extremely proud of her because she got into the University of Washington into their neuroscience program which at the time was the hottest neuroscience program in the country. She got a full ride scholarship. And then she got pregnant. She was single. The father was uh, a member of the faculty of California State University, Fresno, who was not me, but whose name will be left unsaid to protect the guilty. So, um, I was really upset because uh, this woman, her name was Denise, decided that she didn't want to move away from the father's, move the baby away from the father. So she gave up her slot in the doc program. And actually one of my colleagues uh, who was a woman was also as equally upset that I was because we had put a lot of time and effort and frankly, neither of us thought it was worth her time to stay in Fresno with the guy who never married her. But um, I was really angry because I invest a lot emotionally in my students. And I was explaining this to my ex and her reaction was, well, you're just so angry because you would have wanted to be the guy that got her pregnant. It had never actually ever been the thought in my mind, but that's how she construed my 
upset with the student for not going on to the doc program. Uh, back to the story about her third husband. Uh, and this is where the children of divorce rat out the ex. So my ex likes to think of herself as an extremely religious person. And she's got two annulments from the Catholic Church for her first two marriages to prove that. Little swipe at religion there. Uh, her husband, current husband, is a wannabe musician. And so he was playing in the church band at mass. And my kids told me the story. Uh, so he was playing with the church band. The leader of the church band was a woman. So I guess they had done an extremely good job playing music that day for mass, Catholic mass. So uh, my ex's husband, well, actually, I'm sorry, tired, got the story a little bit wrong. Forget that. So the band leader went around and gave a hug platonically to each member of the band. And the leader of the band happened to be a woman. And that was the last day my ex's husband was allowed to play in the church band, even though it was a totally innocent platonic hug. I look at such things now and I say, I'm glad I don't live that way anymore. Uh, if I can give you advice off of lecture, the most uh, important thing you can do in your life is marry somebody sane. Uh, I've been with uh, my second wife, Vicki, and um, we just made it to, what was it? Um, yeah, hang on just a sec. We just hit 18 years of marriage. I had to go look at the date on the videotape. I should remember that, but I'm tired. Uh, and I was married 15 to my first uh, wife. And I can tell you, being married to a sane person is much, much, much better for your psychological well being than being married to a crazy, pathologically jealous person. There's a lot of other stuff too, but that's good practical advice, if I could give you any practical advice, marry a sane person. So back to sexual jealousy. Generally, women are more jealous of the physical attractiveness of a potential rival. Men are more jealous of the dominant status of a potential rival. In other words, the two main mate preference criteria that we have. Oh, let me go back one a bit. Um, Vicki, uh, my second wife, is one of my greatest assets. And whereas my ex would uh, be jealous of every woman working in my research group and stuff like that, Vicki has a very different strategy. She is essentially, and she likes this title, she is what I call my lab mom. Uh, so when we have uh, my research students over for a social occasions, stuff like that, uh, they actually like to talk to Vicki more than they like to talk to me. Uh, one of our part-timers, Matt Isles, who was in my lab, uh, commented once, as, when Vicki's around, you just got end up talking to her for hours. But she adopts all of my students, and uh, she's very maternal, and it's great. It's great having a supportive person rather than a destructive person in your life. So back to this stuff, sex differences and jealousy. Right after I left grad school, uh, Randy Larson had come, the first author of your personality textbook uh, to the University of Michigan a year before I left. Uh, and Larson is kind of a little bit of a mentor. I didn't get to know him that super well in grad school because I was finishing my thesis and he was just moving to Michigan. Uh, Randy does a lot of psychophysiological research and to personality traits. And so he brought all kinds of toys to measure physiological processes with him to Michigan. 
uh, I helped him set his lab up. So, and by helped him carrying big boxes of stuff and things. David, um, boss, my mentor, always finds ways to play with other people's toys, put it simply. And so Randy brings this in and they figure out that they're going to do this study looking at sexual jealousy and physiological responses to it. Uh, so they put people in a chair. Now I'm using only for comedic value, an electric chair here. It's actually was the chair they sat in was a big uh, cushy, uh, comfortable chair, an easy chair. So people were comfortable while they were doing that. And they had electrodes placed on them. So they put some electrodes on the brow and this gets corrugator frowning. Then they put sensors on the first and third finger to get uh, electrodermal response, which is basically uh, how much you're sweating. Uh, the higher the amount of sweat on your fingers, the higher rate electricity will conduct across those two fingers. If you're cool, calm, and collected, you get a little bit of electrical flow. If you're sweaty, you get a lot. And then they put a sensor on the right thumb for heart rate. If you've been to the doctor's, you know, the doctor's office for a checkup, now they just put one of those little sensors on your thumb. So you're all wired up. Then they did something called a mood induction technique. And while individuals were wired up, they had them do a couple of different things. First of all, they had them imagine their partner, well, this was randomly distributed, but it's the first condition I'm telling you about. Uh, they had people imagine your partner having sex with somebody else. So you had to sit in this chair, all wired up, and imagine your partner's having sex with a, another person. Second condition, imagine your partner falling in love with somebody else. So you get at the two primary main mechanisms. Guys always being worried about certainty of paternity are more worried about uh, their woman having sex with somebody else. Women worrying about a male defecting and leaving her high and dry to raise the kids is gonna worry more about the guy falling in love with somebody else. Uh, my wife is the victim of that one. Her father, and uh, my wife is one of four kids, uh, fell in love with somebody else who was three years older than her oldest sister and dumped his first family and married this woman and then didn't invest in the family at all. Uh, kind of a ne'er-do-well kind of guy. But, um, so Vicki is the, uh, and she had a lot of hard times growing up because her dad was not supportive. He would drag the kids out to show he was a father when he had a new girlfriend and wanted to uh, do the Disneyland dad kind of thing. But my wife does not have fond memories of her dad at all because of that abandonment. So once you had that idea firmly in your head that your partner was either having sex with somebody else or falling in love with somebody else. You pressed a button and then you uh, were sending readings to the uh, electrophysiological recording devices. So what happened? Guys were really upset by the physical distress of, sexu of sexual dis eh, start again, sorry. Trying to go too fast. Guys were really upset about sexual infidelity. The average male heart rate went up five beats per minute uh, over baseline. Skin conductance, uh, the galvanic skin rating, 1.5 units above baseline. Corrugator frowning, 7.75 microvolt increase, which is a major increase. And so guys are getting upset just sitting in a chair thinking about their partner uh, having sex 
with somebody else. Stacy sent me a comment, but let me get through these two uh, conditions and I'll read it and comment on it. So guys upset by the physiological stuff. Women uh, were far more upset by the emotional infidelity. Uh, and you see their heart rates went up and so did corrugator frowning. Heart rate went up almost as much for sexual infidelity as it did for emotional infidelity, but um, an increase in both. Now there is a hypothesis that came after uh, Bus started publishing these data called the double shot hypothesis, which is kind of true because basically it doesn't matter if your partner's fooling around with somebody or emotionally fooling around with somebody, you get upset. So both of them work. They're not totally mutually exclusive, but Bus just kind of teased that apart for the study. Now, Stacy asks the question, what does it mean when a woman finds out that her husband is cheating but does not want to see it as worth getting a divorce? That's a very intriguing question. And like most things, there isn't a one-size-fits-all answer. A lot of times, uh, you'll have women, women that will be forgiving of a guy's sexual dalliances. Uh, and uh, as long as the guy does not emotionally defect from her, uh, she might turn a blind eye to his affairs. This is especially true of extremely high status, extremely rich guys. And uh, you find it as the typical male excuse. Oh, it didn't mean anything, it was just sex. Now I know for a lot of women that's not gonna fly, but for many women it's gonna be acceptable. Uh, if a woman is not going to lose the guy and lose all his resources by divorcing him. Uh, so a lot of it has to do with whether the woman sees it as an emotional defection versus just plain old sex. And again, you know, when you get to idiosyncratic cases, you get all kinds of stuff happening. We're talking about general trend stuff. So hopefully that kind of answered your question best as I could, Stacy. Um, Oh, hit the wrong button. Now, what do we do um, also in terms of mate retent or mate stuff? We guard our mates. So we have to worry about people stealing our mates. We get jealous to keep them from doing that. But um, Bus also developed this idea called mate guarding or mate retention. Uh, and it's this thing that also applies to the animal world. Animals guard their mates. Um, let me give you a couple of extreme examples of mate guarding so that you can ensure your fraternity. There is a species of, it's either a frog or a toad. The male mounts the female, has sex with her, and then stays on top of her and rides on her back. Now the males in this case are smaller than the females until she has the babies, the offspring. Uh, if he's riding on her back, it doesn't give a guy, another male, the opportunity to have sex with her. Uh, and other animals have all kinds of strategies to guard uh, their parental certainty. Uh, one of the most extreme is the stick bug. The male stick bug uh, inseminates the female with, uh, the biologists don't call it a penis, it's... Uh, a stick-like thing, which is not why they're called stick bugs, they basically look like sticks, in his ejaculate, which isn't technically an ejaculate, but it's the easiest way to talk about it, uh, is also a gluey substance. So basically he's gluing his penis into the female. After having sex and inserting this glue into her, he breaks off his penis which sounds excruciating and hard to anthropomorphize, flies away and dies. You can make your own editorial comments about that one. They're kind of intriguing. 
So other animals guard their mates in lots of interesting ways. Uh, the two primary, well, there are some primary tactics that males do versus females in terms of mate guarding. Men tend to try to conceal their partners from rivals, hide them, uh, use threats of violence, uh, show off resources, or submit and debase themselves. I'll give you some examples of each one of these in a moment. Women tend to try to outcompete rivals in terms of appearance and manipulation, or some kind of emotional manipulation like inducing jealousy. So we guard our mates in different ways than other animals do. Here is a table from Buss's uh, paper on mate guarding from the late 1980s. Uh, incidentally, I did the data analysis on this paper. Uh, and the tactics, uh, groups of behaviors in mate guarding go from tactics from vigilance to violence. And there's male and female versions of this. I just uh, took the male version and this is some of the mate guarding tactics. Uh, so let's look at some of these. You don't have to memorize them all. But uh, vigilance, uh, calling her at unexpected times, making sure that she was where she said she was, concealing the mate, uh, didn't take her to a party when there would be potential rivals, didn't let her talk to other men. Uh, one of the biggest crimes committed by male spousal abusers is to conceal and sequester their mates so that they don't, have to be, they don't have to worry about being threatened by rivals. And you'll see this happen by male spousal abusers all the time. One of the things they'll do is they'll move the woman to a new city, not let her have a job, not let her have transportation, not let her have friends, uh, so they don't have to worry about such things. So if you're a woman and you ever start getting into one of these situations where your partner's trying to uh, take you away from your social network and isolate you, be very careful, you might be an abuser. Um, I have learned the hard way that I need to grab these things when they happen. But I missed grabbing the story from uh, the local news. Several years ago, there was this rich guy he had a big, uh, one of those big houses that are out in the rural areas of Fresno. It was gated. He had video cameras that he could access from his office. And he told his wife she wasn't supposed to talk to any other guys, period. So the poor UPS driver, I don't know what would happen in the days of Amazon with this guy. This was before Amazon shopping. Drops off a package talks to the woman, the guy sees this, he's monitoring it, drives, hunts down the UPS driver and beats him up for talking to his wife. Naturally, he was imprisoned uh, for doing that against the other guy, and the poor guy didn't do anything. But some guys act in extreme ways. Uh, monopolizing the maid's time. Have you ever been in a relationship or seen a relationship where Two people are kind of walking hand in joint every place. They're like together 24 seven. Uh, if you're in that situation, there's, you know, you can't have an affair if your partner is always with you. Oh, whoops, sorry, slide accidentally moved. Emotional manipulation, threatened to harm himself, made the woman feel guilty, uh, put the other guy down, competitors got down. Here you get the resource and strength thing. Uh, said the other guy was stupid, meaning he probably doesn't have any earning capacity, or called him kind of a wimp guy, uh, put down his strength. But there are nice things we do as guys to keep our mates. Uh, how about resource display? Buying her a lot of expensive gifts, spending lots of money on her. How about a way of keeping your mate just simply loving and caring her for her? Uh, Submission and debasement, uh, basically making yourself a slave to the other person. Physical signs of possession. Uh, these two include uh, keeping the person close, 
but a lot of times you see a physical sign of possession, a wedding ring on a woman. Uh, and you know from the TV Diamond commercials that you're supposed to spend, a guy's supposed to spend, what, three and a half months of his salary on an engagement ring for his fiance. Uh, you got a rich guy that could be lots and lots of money and big, big ring. Uh, threaten other people, violence towards the partner, violence towards the rival. Don't like to talk about that stuff, but unfortunately it happens. So we guard our mates. Uh, men devote more effort to mate retention tactics when they think their partners are being unfaithful. Uh, youth and physical attractiveness is uh, related to male mate guarding. Uh, the younger, more attractive a woman uh, the guy is with, the more mate guarding. Women uh, that are older and have less reproductive value don't get guarded nearly as much. Uh, the research shows that postmenopausal women are the least mate guarded of all women. Uh, doesn't very work that way for age and attractiveness for women. Uh, women are primarily worried about income and status of the spouse and losing those resources. Okay. What's love got to do with it? Romantic love. Uh, I'll let you watch the Tina Turner video on your own. Uh, we just don't have a lot of time to do that. Love stuff. You might wonder about scientifically studying love, but for evolutionary psychologists, uh, love is a interesting empirical question. One of the reasons is love is found worldwide. It is a common human phenomenon, romantic love. Every known culture has some form of marriage arrangement. It may be something uh, extremely elaborate. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, there was the real big blowout thing for Meghan and Harry, you know, the big uh, Westminster Cathedral wedding, uh, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Or it might be a primitive uh, human uh, Spe not species, primitive human group that uh, just the two people say, okay, we're married. But every culture has some kind of marriage agreement. And I don't know if I've said this in class. I might have. I forget where I've said stuff before. Uh, one of my favorite stats of all time, 90% of us get married at least once in our lifetimes. You get any species to get 90% of them doing the same thing, it's pretty remarkable. Some of us don't get it right the first time, we have to try again, but 90% of us get married at least once. So it is a very important human phenomenon. What problems does getting married uh, solve from an evolutionary point of view? Uh, uh, whoops, sorry. Uh, provisioning and shelter for both people. Uh, you've all heard the old saying, two can live as cheaply as one. Uh, two people getting together, you get protection for the woman, parental and care and nurturing for the children, for the guy. You have somebody to have sex with on a regular basis, which isn't a bad thing, and you have someone who's committed to you. Again, this is a long lecture in the evolution class. Just a short view for you here. Hendrick and Hendrick uh, talk about romantic love, and they talk about different kinds of romantic love. Um, one thing they talk about is eros. Uh, eros is strong physical attraction, intense emotional experience, uh, you prefer that other person's appearance. 
and you have the sense of inevitability of the relationship. It's kind of the star-crossed lovers kind of thing. Um, and I have experienced this with my second wife. Uh, so let me explain a little bit about that. Uh, give you the real short version of the story. You have to take the evolution class to get the whole thing. First time I ever saw my wife was in divorce court. Kind of a strange place to see your partner for the first time. Uh, my ex, uh, my soon-to-be ex, and uh, my current wife were sitting together in court having this extremely animated story, or discussion, excuse me. And I'm sitting on the other side of the courtroom being the typical shy guy. I took a stack of grading to do while I was waiting for my case to get up, to uh, come up before the judge. So I look across and I see this extremely attractive woman, kind of looks a little bit like Julia Roberts to me. And I think in my head, well, that's a woman I'll never get a chance to go out with. So don't think much more than that. Um, I'm teaching uh, a little bit of time later, I'm teaching my personality class. And I make a standing offer to all my students that uh, if you want to come into my office during office hours, which you can't do now, but you can do it Zoom wise if you want to, uh, talk about career options and psychology. Uh, so I'm back in my office after class. This woman uh, bolts into my doorway and says, I've got to get back to work. I don't have any time to talk to you during the day because I work full time. Can I call you at night and talk about career stuff? Now, my ex had um, not allowed me to her jealousy to have phone discussions with students at home. And frankly, I had agreed to that only because a group of drunken students called me at 1030 one night to talk about things with me. And they all sang the old song, Don't Worry, Get Happy to Me. And uh, it really upset my wife that drunken students were calling my house. I just thought it was funny. So I couldn't take calls from students, but now I was divorced or separated. I can't remember whether divorce was final yet. So she goes, can I call you at home? And I, after all these years of oppressive jealousy, said, sure, you can call me at home. I was kind of bucking up my stuff because I paid for my phone bill now and I could have anyone who wanted to call me, call me. So we started talking about work stuff and it turned out that I found out that she was the same woman that was sitting in court with my ex-wife, making this a very short story. Uh, fortunately for both of us, uh, Vicki was in her last semester of school. So the semester ended. I had my grades in, let's just say, unusually quickly. And I asked her out at graduation, and we've been together ever since. So, you know, we have this weird straw-crossed uh, inevitability of relationship going on uh, in our relationship. And it's my best example of it. Um, another kind of love in Hendrick and Hendrick scheme is Ludus love. Here's where people kind of play love as a game. Uh, they're not serious about it. Uh, they might deceive partners. They don't disclose different relationships to people. Uh, they may be people, for example, there were a group of guys one time who were keeping count of how many uh, women they could have sex with. Uh, you get stuff like that. Storge is a kind of love that's more like a friendship kind of love. It's quiet, it's companion, and it's just kind of comfortable. There's pragma. Pragma basically are people who are shopping with for mates and they have a list, whether it's a list inside of their head or they've actually uh, written it down. Uh, in my first round of dating, 
Uh, I went out once with a woman who was a pragma dater. She had a long list of things she wanted in a mate and told me all of them on the first date. So she uh, told me that she wanted to find somebody and she wanted to have a Victorian style house, literally with a white picket fence. She wanted to have two kids, a boy and a girl, uh, a German shepherd as a dog. And then there was going to be a playhouse in the yard that was a miniature version of the full size house. All of this on the first and last date, because I guess I didn't fit into uh, her shopping list of things because I had planned on going to graduate school and all that stuff, and she didn't want to wait all that long. And I hope she found the guy that built her all that stuff and she got all her stuff she wanted. But uh, you find people who use computer dating uh, oftentimes will be pragma lovers. You'll see these long lists of preferences they have on their profiles for mates. Mania, stay away from the mania lovers. I've seen this. I've had friends that have been involved in it. I understand it as a psychologist. I don't understand it personally. These are people that have these extreme roller coaster kind of relationships. They're either utterly in ecstasy with the other person or they're utterly in pain. Uh, they're either very high, they're very low. I've had friends that have done this. I've been really happy when they've been super in love with the other person. And then they have an argument and they break up and you say, look at them and say, oh God, I'm glad that's over with. They were suffering so badly. You see them a couple of months later, they're back with the same person and they're high again. These usually always end up bad. I don't suggest these. Agape love. Uh, picking on Big Bang Theory here. Uh, Amy Ferris Fowler, good example of agape love, sacrificial love, giving everything up to Sheldon. Uh, this is kind of a sacrificial love. You put the other person's welfare above yours. Usually you find this form of love happening sporadically in relationships. And in long-term relationships, you may find that it balances out over time. And it may be caused by a traumatic event. I have um, a good friend who's now retired, whose wife had a serious form of cancer and was bedridden for many years. Uh, when I visited his house, um, in the living room, he had her hospital bed. He would sit in his easy chair. She would sit in her hospital bed. He tried to have as normal a life with her as he could, sacrificed all kinds of stuff for her. And eventually she passed. He was grief-stricken, um, found new love several years later, and is now living happily ever after. But a lot of times it's because of one of those situations. In groups of people like students, um, some of you might be experiencing agape love right now. You might be um, going to school uh, while your partner works full time to support you. Uh, I know many couples that do that. One person works, the other one goes to school. Then when the first person graduates from school, they work full time and support the other person while they are um, going to school. So that's a little bit about love. Sexual fantasies. Now this is a one that originally I kind of poo-pooed, but the more I looked at it, the more I thought it was kind of interesting and fit in. And again, you're getting the short version. Uh, lots of uh, good Fifty Shades of Grey humor for sexual fantasy stuff. So here are 50 different shades of lampshades. Here's a feminist version, one shade of gray, a feminist fam fantasy. No, she said, and he respected her wish and pestered her no more. The end. 
Uh, Fifty Shades of Grey is only romantic because the guy is rich. If he'd been living in a trailer, it would be an episode of Criminal Minds or SUV, SVU. Sorry, my dyslexia was going on there. Last one I'll show you. Let's reenact the fantasy scenes in Fifty Shades of Grey, like the one where she gets a job straight out of college. A uh, big difference in male and female sexual fantasies. Uh, men fantasize about sex far more than women do. Probably didn't need this class to know that. Uh, let's talk about women's sexual fantasies first. Women typically have fantasies about an alpha male. Whether he's a corporate CEO, movie star, sports star, uh, my poster child for this part of the lecture is Daniel Craig playing James Bond. Very much the alpha guy, right? All of the James Bonds and alpha Bonds. I think that Daniel Craig is the best James Bond since Sean Connery, but I was a kid in the 60s, so I'm uh, fixated on Sean Connery as the James Bond. Now, with female alpha male fantasies, they always find that the guy has a troubled and tempestuous soul. This is uh, from a quote from one of the articles. Only a woman's love can heal. In other words, no matter how much of an alpha male he is, he's still a fixer-upper. Stupidity, something women never fantasize about. And women's sexual fantasy literature shows up a lot in romance novels. Romance novels make up 40% of paperback sales in this country. Usually sexual fantasies in romance novels uh, are on some kind of love story. Each romance novel has to have a unique heroine and uh, they form romance novels form a form of erotica and adventure fiction for women now one of the reasons that romance novels have to have a unique heroine is because the woman's supposed to marry the guy and they live happily ever after so the woman can't be in multiple romance novels because she's supposed to be living happily ever after although there are a series of romance novels um, and i'll show you some of that as we look into female fantasies about uh, sexual fantasy or activity excuse me in romance novels uh, is not essential to the story and it always serves the plot and the focus is on things that women are uh, very sensitive to and consider very important in relationships like love and commitment and those types of variables uh, this is just for fun. Uh, a while ago, I found this uh, website where people make fake uh, romance novel covers. These are all real romance novel covers, but they've been photoshopped with new titles and things. Uh, I was originally using one of these in my lecture that I thought was real. Later on, found out it was fake. I'll tell you about that one in a minute. Here are some of my favorites just to amuse you. Uh, I can see right up your nostrils. Uh, kind of a fantasy one there. Dude, where's my sword? Kind of a spin on Dude, where's my car? The old movie. Quickly in the swamp of death. At the end, he could only satisfy the swarm of hungry leeches. For the love of Scotty McMullet. This is one students usually find the most amusing. Uh, the little subcaption there is too bad they didn't have Camaros yet. Lord of the Hissy Fit. Um, stuff like that. I got a lot more in the Evolution Psych lecture. Here's a real romance novel. Just to give you some context here. I uh, took this from the Harlequin website. and. Um, you can see that, uh, let me read you the back of the book. 
only because I get a big kick out of doing this. Christmas is approaching and a holiday in the snowy Alps. Let me move my camera a little bit so I can read easier. Uh, Christmas in the Alps with her young son should be a pleasure for single mom Crystal. But it means facing the man who affects her like no other. Raoul Broussard. There has always been a spark between Raoul and Crystal, but he is her late husband's brother and she is determined to keep her distance. Yet as sleigh rides and toasty log fires bring her closer to Raoul, Crystal must confront the way he makes her and the heartwarming way he connects with her son. So you can see all the emotional stuff going on in this book. Um, male sexual fantasies, a lot easier to talk about. Uh, here is a quote from a paper by Ellison uh, Simons about male sexual fantasies. Uh, yeah, McKenna, there is a whole website devoted to those uh, things, uh, relatively easy to Google on the web. Uh, there's probably 50 or 60 of them. Uh, those are kind of the ones I find the most amusing. Uh, but I, like I said, I, this is the short version. Uh, so male sexual fantasies, Ellis and Simons. Uh, the most striking feature of male fantasy is sex is sheer lust and physical gratification, devoid of encumbering relationships, emotional aberration, complicated plot lines, flirting, courtship, and foreplay. In other words, uh, well, I'll show you that in a second. Here's a simple, a uh, simple sample. A simple, it's simple, but it's also a sample. I was just looked at the time and I was looking at how many slides I got to get through. Being a mayor of a small town filled with nude girls, 20 to 24, I like to take walks and pick out the best looking one that day. She engages in intercourse with me. All the women have sex with me anytime I want male fantasy. Male pornography, minimal plot development, male viewer imagines the women in the scenes having sex with her. If you look at uh, female porn stars, they kind of are exaggerations of women with high mate value. Interesting thing about gay and straight porn, uh, for males, uh, gay and straight porn, essentially identical, only the sex of the actors, very indiscriminate sexual behavior in male porn. The whole uh, fantasy, the whole goal of male porn is orgasm rather than living happily ever after. A uh, big change of pace here as we try to finish this stuff up. Evolution and art. Uh, an interesting topic that I've been giving more time to in the other class. David Barish, a evolutionary biologist who's one of my heroes, uh, talks about art. He says art developed as a way of dealing with spare time that our ancestors had. Uh, you can imagine uh, in the evening on the savannah plains around a campfire, people developing arts by starting to tell stories or people decorating their hunting or gathering things uh, when they're out, not out working. Uh, Bear says that music fosters social bonding and group cohesion. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about religion here as well, but think about uh, going to church and attending a service, everybody sings to bond together, stuff like that. Uh, sailors used to sing songs when they were doing work to help the work go by, lots of groups have. Bearer says the most damning critique of any work of literature, for example, isn't believable. Um, I'm not a big fan of a lot of the Marvel movies. I know many of you probably are, my kids are. Uh, one of the things I have trouble with is I find them unbelievable. I was trying to watch the Captain America movies. I think the second or third one. 
uh, because when I was a kid, I read Captain America comic books. And so I thought it'd be cool to watch this. And I'm watching this movie and these people fall like a hundred feet, land on their feet, uh, and immediately start engaging in um, martial arts fighting with each other where I'm looking at it and I'm saying, fake, you fall 150 feet on your feet, your bones are going to be crushed. And so I just have a hard time believing a lot of the CGI stuff I see in uh, especially the Marvel movies. If you look at most literature, the literature that really gets us, uh, gets at important patterns of our behavior as humans. Art usually appears universally in our species. Uh, this is not a child I know. This is a picture I've stolen from the web. Uh, little kids will do art. I remember as a small child spending lots of time drawing. Uh, in pre-industrial societies, uh, Alan DeSinek has found that tons of effort are devoted to the arts. And the arts generally bring us pleasure. We get pleasure through music, through dancing, through uh, literature, reading a good book, uh, being able to create a nice work of art. And young kids are naturally predisposed to do art. Uh, I have a ready supply when my grandkids come over of paper, crayons. Uh, they love it that grandpa has paper and stuff and they always want to get into my office and get into all the stuff. So I have stuff for them to get into like paper and crayons and uh, they play with all the stuff that I've got in here and they always want to show off their pictures. Here is my what grandson Kane who decided to decorate himself with my uh, stepdaughter's uh, lipstick Ooh. and uh, then she videotaped it. You can tell he looks quite proud of himself as he uh, walks around uh, with his, uh, let's say, war paint on his lipstick and mom buys very expensive lipstick, like the MAC stuff she likes. I know that's really expensive. And kids just naturally do art. They like mark make, uh, you know, the Senate calls it mark making initially. Uh, they like music, moving to music. Uh, my stepdaughter had music playing there. Kids sing, they play with words, they dress up. They like acting out stories. Uh, so kids naturally are engaged in art. Uh, art isn't just done by professional artists. Aiken studied art and aesthetic responses, and he says it takes no training to respond to art. This is a Goya, the Spanish artist picture from the 1800 or 1600s, I think. Uh, it's one of the titans, mythological creatures, uh, eating a woman. It's supposed to gross you out. Uh, we get emotional reactions to art. This one is a gross out picture. It's supposed to gross you out. Some art we look at gives us great pleasure. Other art gives us great pain. And art evokes predictable emotional responses that are universal, trying to finish quickly here. And it doesn't require a whole lot of thought. Go into a museum, look at a painting, either like it or not like it. You don't need to think about it a whole lot. And oftentimes when we see a piece of art, this is one of the piece, first pieces of art ever found. It's a female form that's overly exaggerated. It's a fertility goddess. Uh, we sometimes don't necessarily have the words to explain our reactions to art. Art can be used for manipulation. Here's Captain America again, but World War II propaganda poster from the United States. Uh, government. And oftentimes art is used to manipulate us. Here it's uh, join Captain America and the armed forces, beat the bad guys. Uh, art allows us to control things. I'm moving really fast, sorry. 
uh, cause I wanted to get to this one. You see this one's very racist. This was like an American propaganda poster uh, showing that uh, the Germans and Nazis, I mean the German Nazis and the Japanese are out to get us. They're looking at our shores. The Japanese and German person are painted in a very uh, offensive stereotypical way. Uh, and warns us about the dangers of uh, these groups against us. Religion and evolution. Just give me a minute or two to finish this one. Um, think about whether, yeah, let me just do this one for a minute. Voltaire, the French uh, philosopher says, if God didn't exist, we'd have to invent him. Uh, religion from an evolutionary perspective, uh, believing in a supreme God offers protection uh, and the necessities to uh, sustain life. And those individuals that aren't faithful in a godlike figure generally didn't survive as well as those people who believed in God. Barish, again, who's, like I said, one of my heroes, says religion provides a glue that uh, gets us together socially, some kind of social cohesion. Binds us together. Religion binds people together as groups far better than any other kind of group bonding. And religion puts the individual at the service of the group which is a very important social side thing. Gives us a moral code and religion takes a hand in teaching morals to us, morality. Other things that Cardong says about uh, religion, uh, supernatural authorities always watchful. God is watching out. If you're sitting by yourself, God is still watching, making sure that you're doing right rather than wrong. And religion indoctrinates us into the rules and myths of a society. Private actions and intimate thought are open for spiritual inspection. Uh, we can't hide from God. And God uh, knows all sins, public and private. So if you do something and no one else sees it, then it's wrong, God still knows. Uh, I'm going to skip some, yeah, okay, well, that was my last religious slide. May as well do it. Religion provides a mechanism to enforce the rules of society. Most likely the first uh, rules we had about society was some kind of organized religion. So a couple more slides on evolution, then we're done. Uh, lessons learned over the last couple times we've been talking about this. Our brains and bodies are shaped by the savanna plains of Africa. We are all Africans, no matter how, even me as pale-faced as I am, uh, has African ancestors. Our brains and bodies contain the vestiges of, of our human and pre-human ancestors. Much of our behavior is hardwired but the software can override the wiring. Our brains are sophisticated enough that we're not purely instinctual critters. We can observe evolutionary psychology in our everyday lives. I think that's one of the powerful things about it. We know that guys can be to have a tendency to be indiscriminate. There's Charlie Sheen, my poster child for the indiscriminate male. And we know women are choosy and selective. We know that we can make many predictions from this simple sex difference, which is the end. Uh, I was going to give you a best of other lectures, but we're out of time. Screen sharing, okay. Sorry, I had that message pop in the middle of my screen. So that's my lecturing for the semester. 
Tuesday we'll meet to talk about the final review. Uh, any last questions before we call it a day? Guys are being very quiet. Okay, well, if that's the case, I'm gonna let you take off. And uh, will you be available for office hours today? Today, no, I've got a super busy agenda. I will be available for my office hours tomorrow afternoon at two. Uh, if you can't make those, uh, we'll make an appointment at another time. Okay, folks. Will there be attendance? No, because I'm just gonna give you all the points. I just gave up. There's just too many people having too many different issues. I'm just gonna give you the 30 points for the sheltering part of class. So you're off the hook on that one. Uh, I'm just trying to make it easy. Okay, well, you guys have a great afternoon. Wonderful weekend. We will see you Tuesday on the flip side, if not in office hours or something like that before. And I know, McKenna, you want to uh, join the lab, but we'll talk about that in the fall when we get back to some kind of normality. And yes, I'm looking for people that are continuing on next year. Uh, I'm kind of down in people in my lab, so I'm looking to build up some research assistance. So if you're interested, uh, get in touch with me and we'll talk for the fall. So bye guys, we will take care and uh, I will see you Tuesday.